All right, uh, well, glad to have everybody here today. Glad to see you. We are finishing up uh, Daniel chapter 5, just talking about the very end, uh, in fact, like the last verse of chapter 5, because that goes together with the first verse of chapter 6. And actually, in the original Hebrew uh, book of uh, Daniel, how the uh, early, um, how the BC uh, Masoretes, they are the scribes who helped uh, preserve the Word of God and copy it and so on. The scribes uh, divided it up. They had uh, chapter 6, verse 1 be the last uh, verse, uh, chapter 5, verse uh, 32 uh, in the Hebrew. And, uh, but in our English Bible, somebody decided at some point, let's put uh, what, what we call chapter 6, verse 1, let's put that with chapter 6 as an introduction. Well, it kind of bridges, you know, as you might guess, bridges the end of chapter 5 and the beginning of chapter 6. Uh, because uh, Darius the Mede is uh, the one that, who uh, shows up and appears at the very end of chapter 5. And, um, and we're going to talk about why he is uh, important here. And that's uh, kind of the point here. <clears throat> so, uh, in the very beginning, uh, I, I showed you, and, and maybe, uh, maybe this actually would be a good time to show it again. Uh, may, so, I would like to uh, talk a little bit and introduce this uh, before I fire up the video clip. I think I, think I still have it there on my uh, computer. But uh, in chapter 5, verse 31, uh, it says, uh, Daniel says, Darius the Mede inherited or received the kingdom. And we're going to talk about that. So what happened in chapter 5 is uh, King Belshazzar, he's the acting king, as you may recall, his dad was the true king. Uh, but what was the message? Why did this hand appear uh, writing on the wall? And what did the hand write? And what was the message uh, that uh, Daniel interpreted for Belshazzar. Let's just review what we learned in chapter 5. That his time was up. Yeah, your time is up. You've been weighed. That's one of the words that uh, the hand wrote up there, was weighed. You've been weighed and measured, and you, you came up short. You, you are too light, is uh, the word that uh, Daniel uses, which sounds like the word uh, shekel, uh, actually in uh, Aramaic, tekel, which is uh, like the Hebrew word shekel, and you've heard that word before. It's a weight, a measure of silver or gold, and a shekel is a certain weight, uh, so that, you know, just like even in our country, we have a Bureau of Weights and Measures. Let's make sure everybody says, you know, or if you are going to the gas station and buying one gallon of gas, make sure you're getting, receiving, one gallon and not nine-tenths of a gallon or, or something like that, you know? Make sure nobody's getting cheated. A gallon is a gallon. We have, have to have an official definition of what a gallon is so that you know you're getting what you paid for, right? And shekel was the same kind of way, uh, weight, um, so that everybody had a standard. See, the standard, well, God has standards, so King Belshazzar, and you haven't measured up. And so, what was the what's the message of judgment for Belshazzar and his ruling as king? <clears throat> and this is the word paras uh, in the last uh, of the words that uh, the hand wrote up on the wall. Paras, P-R-S. Uh, it is uh, first of all, it means divided or split. So your kingdom is going to be split, uh, but uh, and it's going to happen by P-R-S, or also the main consonants in the uh, word Persia, the name Persia. And so Daniel uh, kind of builds off of it. This is a, a pun kind of thing that Larry should be able to appreciate. Daniel is making puns uh, for all these things and saying, hey, you know, uh, the, the Persians are the ones who are going to divide and split uh, the kingdom here. And... So the ironic thing is, even while Daniel is speaking, Darius the Mede, who is also called Cyrus the Persian, he is already coming in, sneaking through the, uh, the aqueducts, uh, sneaking through uh, tunnels underneath uh, the city, and coming in, sort of like the, uh, in the uh, Greek uh, Trojan War, you know, the big uh, Trojan uh, horse 
uh, idea of they're sneaking into the city and when nobody is watching and when everybody is asleep at night or whatever, they come out of the Trojan horse and take over everything, right? It's that kind of idea. Cyrus the, the Persian is coming in. He's, again, called Darius the Mede. And uh, he's taking over everything that very night. And so Daniel is saying, hey, Belshazzar, your kingdom is, uh, your reign is going to be taken away from you. And in fact, uh, he was killed too. Let's read that uh, section here in uh, just the last uh, part of Daniel chapter 5. If you want to turn to Daniel, if you haven't already. <clears throat> and, uh, okay, so let's look at... Uh, uh, verses 30. Um, we're going to read Daniel chapter 5, verse 30 through uh, 6, uh, verse 1. Uh, actually, no, never mind. Uh, six, it's 6 1. Uh, I, I said it backwards earlier. Now I have to correct uh, what I said. Uh, chap uh, verse 31 is uh, 6 verse 1 in the Hebrew. That, I said it backwards uh, that it's. Uh, that the Hebrew text ends with verse 30, and then 6.1 is uh, what we call 5.31 here. So, sorry about that, that I said it backwards earlier. But uh, anyway, let's just read 5 verses 30 and 31. Uh, so, will somebody read those for us? I'll take it. That very night, Belshazzar, king of the Babylonians, was slain, and Darius the Mede took over the kingdom at the age of 62 pleased Darius to appoint 120 satraps to rule throughout the kingdom. All so right. you want to go through two yet? <coughs> no, we'll just uh, we'll stop there for now. So, um, what I want to underline, and really we can hardly emphasize the importance of this. Uh, okay, I do have the video clip here again. Um, and that is that basically Darius came in, Darius, a.k.a. Cyrus. And we'll have to look at the uh, our study guide, too, before, <coughs> before we watch this uh, video clip. And, uh, and that is, uh, we want to see, this is going to talk about how Darius and Cyrus are the same person and the significance uh, of him. So, uh, could we get a reader on the, uh, um, on the study guide here? You can either read that first paragraph or you could just take the whole part under uh, 531, the very bottom of the last part of our Daniel 5 study guide there. So either read that just the first paragraph or you can read the whole thing, it's up to you. So. The story told in this chapter, Daniel, the lion's den is most well known. No, we're on uh, five, on the on part that says 531. Uh, oh yeah, we're on this uh, study book. We're on uh, right there, five, oh, there. Darius the Mede received the kingdom. Okay. Darius the Mede receives the kingdom. There has been much debate over the identity of Darius the Mede. But, long story short, in 628, Daniel says that, the, that he prospered during the reign of Darius, which is the reign of Cyrus the Persian. It makes sense that Daniel would be interested in him if he, were, if he may indeed be Cyrus the Isaiah that Isaiah prophesied 150 years earlier in Isaiah 48, 44, 28, and 45, 1. Daniel served in the king's court, so would have known about various life Cyrus, dual heritage, and thus two names: the father being a king of Persia, and his mother a daughter of the king of Media. Darius Cyrus united the Medes and the Persians in his dual heritage as Persian and a Mede. And he eventually became ruler of the combined kingdoms of the Medes and the Persians. Dr. Steinemann says that, it says in the Concordia Commentary, it would have been more accurate to describe him as an active conqueror since he defeated the Babylonians and seized the throne that had been occupied by the Chaldean kings. However, these statements by Daniel should be read as theological in nature. Daniel often uses the passive construction that implies that God is the real agent of action. The statements in 6.1 and 9.1 do not focus on human actions, but instead imply that behind all human authority is God, who makes king of whomever he pleases, a point that 
made Daniel a point made repeatedly in Daniel. <coughs> okay, so the the part what Dan or what Dr. Steinman is talking about is this phrase that I put at the beginning here, Darius the Mede received the kingdom. Why does Daniel say it that way? Why doesn't it say Darius the Mede conquered the kingdom or Darius the Mede came over and took over everything or something like that? Why is Daniel saying Darius the Mede received the kingdom? Because this is a very important theological point here. So, from what we had just read, kind of summarized in your own words, somebody, why, why do you think Daniel is saying Darius the Mede received the kingdom? God's work. <clears throat> yeah. See, God was doing. God is the one who gave it to him, right? And that's the very essential point. And that's what I like about this Daniel movie. Now, you, if you uh, were here in the beginning of our Daniel study, you've seen this clip before already. Uh, but I'm uh, unapologetically showing it to you again because now that we've read through, uh, not only has it been many months since you saw this clip, but now we, we've studied a lot in between then and now, and I think uh, a lot of it's going to make uh, a lot of sense to you at this point. It begin, it's, uh, this is the beginning of the, uh, Daniel, um, the book of Daniel, the movie. And uh, so we won't have to repeat this uh, part when we start watching uh, the, the entire movie, uh, probably next week. Uh, but uh, this is very important. Uh, Daniel is teaching Cyrus. He doesn't even know the God of, uh, of Daniel and, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He doesn't even know the true God, and yet God called him. Beginning 150 years earlier with the prophet Isaiah, and Daniel perceives all this. He sees all this and says, Cyrus, God brought you in and God gave Babylon to you. All right? So. In the next scene, uh, that's kind of the conclusion of the movie because it'll show uh, Cyrus making the proclamation. I declare that uh, the people of Judea who were taken captives are now free to go home. And in fact, I'm going to help them. I'm going to pay for the rebuilding of their city and uh, of their temple and so on. <clears throat> but so that is, I wanted to just kind of reiterate for you the importance of this uh, person, um, Cyrus, also called Darius. But the question may come up, why why talk about it now? If in the movie, they, they're considering Darius a separate king who comes before Cyrus. And we could say, well, why, why is it important to even quibble about that? Well, it's interesting because why does, uh, why does Daniel bring up this person here, uh, Darius the Mede, at the very end saying he's the one who took over from Belshazzar, the very night when Belshazzar died. That's kind of the point of this is uh, at the end of chapter 6 uh, is when uh, Daniel says, So Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and, and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Uh, but in the, in the Hebrew language, that and, when it says, during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus, that and could mean which is also so the reign of Darius the Mede, which is also Cyrus the Persian. Uh, but the point is, and why I wanted to underscore that from uh, the Daniel commentary that Dr. Steinman said, he says uh, uh, this is this is pro uh, names of the same person because his dad was the. Uh, was the king of Persia, I mean not his dad, his uh, grandfather was the king of Persia and uh, and his uh, mother, his mother was the, uh, so his grandfather was king of Persia, his, his dad took over uh, as king of Persia, his mother was uh, the daughter of the king of the Medes, of Media, and, and you know how kings would often uh, give their daughters uh, as part of an alliance to a neighboring king to say, hey, uh, we're, uh, our, our nations are allied, you marry my daughter, and that'll kind of seal and confirm this alliance, right? And so that's what they did. So uh, Darius is a Mede, 
but he's also a Persian. He's both, and that's how he unites the uh, Medes and the Persians, uh, which uh, in history is is known as the Medo-Persian Empire at that point because Cyrus Darius is the one who brought together the Medes and the Persians as one uh, empire. <clears throat> so anyway, that I, I just wanted to underscore about that because the whole point of Daniel is that God is in control of all these things. And just in that one word alone, uh, in uh, chapter 5, uh, verse uh, 31, Darius the Mede, oh, I noticed in the uh, NIV, Darius the Mede took over the kingdom, but the uh, but it, it's a better translation to say he received the kingdom uh, because that's uh, sort of the flavor of the... Uh, of Daniel's uh, Hebrew, or yeah, this is Aramaic actually at this point, the Aramaic word, he received the kingdom. He didn't, like, uh, it's not because of what he did, it's God gave it to him. Okay, so, so sorry for uh, belaboring a, a point, but this is so important. This is the whole point of all this. So back in the book of Isaiah has all the things that Daniel was telling him then? So that yeah, wasn't actually yeah. Daniel. I, and I list the I list the passage that Daniel was quoting Isaiah 44 and 45. There, those are the two specific verses where Cyrus is name mentioned by name. So, over a hundred years before he's even born, uh, Isaiah is writing these things, and so that it's remarkable. About I took a class on the prophet Isaiah. Uh, not about uh, nine or uh, ten years ago in grad school, but uh, anyway, the the teacher was saying you gotta understand and appreciate what a miracle this is and how remarkable that it's so oddly specific. God says, "I'm going to call you by name, Cyrus. Cyrus, I'm going to call you to to do this, to take over Babylon and to set my people free." Uh, and that's why. I think they did a good job in the movie of Daniel coming and saying, uh, and Michelle said, well, wasn't it Nehemiah? Uh, so Nehemiah later also talks to, to uh, King Cyrus as well. But I think it does say Daniel served and prospered under this guy, and uh, at least for a few years before they were able to uh, go home. And I don't know if uh, Daniel ever did actually go uh, back uh, go to back to Judea. Maybe he did, but anyway, the point is that uh, it's so uh, oddly specific uh, that Isaiah mentions Cyrus that it's like this is so miraculous. This uh, prophecy that did come true, you know, amazing, amazing. Yeah. Maybe a little off topic, but in twenty nine. You know, where Daniel tells Belzenar what this all meant. Daniel was clothed in purple, gold chain was placed around him. He was promoted the third highest in the ruler in the kingdom. And that very night, his, his promotion was worthless. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I know. Mean, <coughs> yeah, because the new king, uh, Darius, could come in and say, Well, I'm king now. I'm going to install all my own uh, managers. And so, you know. Yeah, you, you might be the highest manager, uh, Daniel, but you're out of here. I got my own guys. But I don't think, but he did, uh, yeah. clearly. God still had the, the plan to prosper. But uh, as we get into chapter 6, uh, Daniel is not the uh, chief guy under Darius. Uh, Darius almost uh, has to be told about that. Hey, there's this guy, uh, Daniel. Actually, I think he knows uh, Daniel, but he's not as close as, you know, the king's uh, own right-hand man or something like that. It's funny that Belsazar promotes him after he says, your kingdom's over. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I know, that's right. <laughs> he's the bearer of bad news, and yet Belshazzar is uh, glad to have the interpretation. He doesn't know that he's going to die that very night at that point, I think. But uh, he promotes Daniel, and then he dies. <laughs> so. Okay, uh, we, are we ready to get into chapter 6? So, uh, we do want to get into chapter 6. That, that was kind of the, this was all just the extended introduction to that. But it's to show you the remarkable circumstances.
So let's look at, uh, let's just start out with uh, verses 1 to 5 of chapter 6. Could somebody read those for us? It pleased Darius to appoint 120 satraps to rule throughout the kingdom, with three administrators over them, one of whom was Daniel. The satraps were made accountable to them, so that the king might not suffer loss. Now Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to stand <coughs> over the whole kingdom. <clears throat> At this, the administrators and the satraps tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel in his conduct of government affairs, but they were unable to do so. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. Finally, these men said, we will never find any basis for charges against this man, Daniel, unless it is something to do with the law of his God. Okay, so he's so good with you know, 70 years of experience in government administration here in Babylon. That, I mean, it's like, who with 70 years of experience at anything are you going to be able to find something wrong with? I mean, he knows. He, he's the best, you know. <coughs> and, uh, and so, even though, like I said, even though maybe Darius comes in, he doesn't know how exceptional Daniel is until... Well, over time, of course, Daniel proves himself. And now the king is planning, okay, I'm going to do maybe what I should have done, like Belshazzar before me, and appoint Daniel as the, the highest in the kingdom right under me. And that's what uh, Darius plans to do. And these other guys are jealous of Daniel. They need to get rid of him. But the only way they're going to do it is, well, we have, his, uh, his government administration is so impeccable that we can't find any anything, uh, any way to trap him or accuse him in that. But it'll have to be something to do with his uh, spiritual life. So, so they're hatching a plan. Alright, we ready to move on then? So let's look at... Uh, Let's just go another paragraph there, 6 to 9. So the administrators and the satraps went as a group to the king and said, O King Darius, live forever. The royal administrators, perfect satraps, advisors, and governors have all agreed that the king should issue an edict that enforce the decree that anyone who prays to any god or man during the next 30 days, except to you, O king, shall be thrown into the lion's den. Now, O king, issue the decree and put it in writing so that it cannot be altered. In accordance with the laws of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be repealed. So King Darius put the decree in writing. <clears throat> All right, and, and we're familiar with also the book of Esther, which uh, it happens later, that uh, in the book of Esther we have this uh, issue that comes up where the king makes a decree and says, uh, oh, he's tricked into making this decree of the Jews are bad people. We want to uh, get rid of uh, all the Jews in, in uh, Persia. And so I'm going to declare an official, you know, it's the official uh, Persian uh, national kill a Jew day. And he says, okay, I'm declaring uh, whatever day is. The, the Jews call that Purim, which means lots. Uh, but we're going to uh, declare, I can't remember uh, when the, it's, in March uh, sometime. I'll just make up a date. March uh, 24th is National Kill a Jew Day. And it's their their law is such that if the king makes a law, even the king himself can't repeal that law. How does that work? The king knows it. That, okay, I get it. And it's important to make sure it's like, oh, the law is established. What like? Laws that are established and put in writing are unchangeable. Oh, 
Not even if you write a law saying this law is now revoked? Yeah, you can't revoke a law, and that was just their law, Jesus, their understanding law. You can do a loophole. <clears throat> and so this, uh, now in Daniel, uh, Darius knows this. Uh, when a law is made, you can't uh, unmake it. So what happens in Esther, you may remember the story, is, okay, March 24th is National Kill the Jew Day. Uh, so what could the king do after he realizes his own queen, Esther, is one of these Jews that I've just said, uh, everybody celebrate National Kill the Jew Day. So uh, I guess, I, but I can also make a proclamation. I'm going to declare uh, March 24th to be National Jews Defend Themselves Day, right? And so that's what it, what it became. Purim is uh, uh, that they... Actually, uh, they were celebrating the fact that the king said, okay, what date should we set uh, for a national kill a Jew day? Let's cast lots. Uh, let's roll dice and see, uh, you know, they roll, roll the dice and a two and a four came up. Oh, the 24th. Okay, so 24th is national kill a Jew day. And the Jews are kind of making fun of that by calling it lots or purim to say, uh, hey, then uh, the king also said, declared it National Jews Defend Themselves Day, and the Lord was with us, and we, we, we won, you know, we won, and uh, we weren't killed off. And so the Lord helped us, and so it's a day of, uh, I suppose, national uh, celebration and victory for the Jews that they still, I think, celebrate to this day, Purim. So. Uh, but anyway, the point is, the king uh, couldn't revoke the law, but he could make another law uh, to maybe, hopefully, kind of counteract to that one. Uh, why couldn't he uh, say, okay, he's going to make this law. Nobody can pray to anyone except the king himself, uh, but he doesn't know uh, what's going to happen yet. Uh, will he be able to make a uh, counter decree or not in time? We'll have to see. Okay, let's look. Uh, so... Now, all Daniel has to do, once he learns that this law is in place, uh, he wants to be a law-abiding citizen, and he's so law-abiding that, remember, they couldn't even find any evidence uh, against him, not even the slightest thing. And so uh, all Daniel has to do is just not pray to his God for 30 days. I mean, what's, what's the big deal, right? Just don't pray to God for 30 days, Daniel. But does he do that? Well, let's find out. Uh, verses uh, 10, let's go all the way to 12. That's two paragraphs in our text there. 10 to 12. Now when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. Three times a day he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God, just as he had done before. Then these men went as a group and found Daniel praying and asking God for help. So they went to the king and spoke to him about his royal decree. Did you not publish a decree that during the next 30 days anyone who prays to any god or men except to you, O king, would be thrown into the lion's den? And the king answered, The decree stands in accordance with the laws of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be repealed. Okay, so it says, yep, it's a, it's a uh, law. Yep, we made that law. Yep, that's right. That's right. Yeah, they have their cell phones. Yeah, recording him. <laughs> they sent on the footage. They, they sent Daniel up, didn't they? Now we're gonna make this law, and then we're gonna spy on him. We have we have to, uh, you know, you look at verse ten, and you say Daniel is either really dumb or he's just really bold. And of course, we can't accuse Daniel of being dumb, stupid. So uh, we know he's not stupid. So. He's just that bold where not only is he, you know, going to disobey this decree, he has to. Uh, and, and for Daniel, why do you think, why, why doesn't he just, just refrain from praying to God for a month? Is it that hard? Just don't worship God for a month. Uh, what, what, what's Daniel's attitude about that? Well, you're going to ask me to stop breathing for a month as well? I know, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. see? I kind of goes back to the first commandment, and, and you have one God, and now you're you're following by 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 not doing that, you're actually following their law. Yeah, see, 
by not uh, worshiping God, not praying to God. It's not only natural, I mean, it's, it's our very life, but to not do worship or pray to God would be to deny God. And I think this is a case of God being in control because he didn't go in private. And in a sense, they could because they say, don't, don't pray out where everybody sees you, right? But to be recognized. That's the yeah, case, right? he's in his room. But so he opened up his window and, and was seen, was able to be seen. So is that God's hand in there because of what's going to come after this? Yeah, and his windows happened to be, he, he must have requested or he had a room where the, there are windows that face to the southwest, which would be toward Jerusalem. And why is that? And I have a, uh, I have a note in our study guide there. I didn't talk about the introductory uh, paragraphs on your study guide. Well, maybe we'll come back to those. But this point here is uh, when, uh, when Solomon is building uh, this temple, actually David, when David's talking to the Lord about building a temple, this is what I want to do, Lord. And... And God is saying, uh, okay, build this temple, David. Actually, you're, you're not going to be the one to finish it. Uh, your son Solomon will, but that's another point. Uh, but David is like, let this be your house, your dwelling here on earth, and let everybody be able to come and to say, this is uh, the Lord's house, and, and then our, our prayers will be, that you will hear our prayers and all this. And, uh, and David, in fact, is like, and everybody who is not in Jerusalem at this temple can face toward the temple and offer their prayers toward the temple. And that's uh, the, uh, the phrase that uh, David uses is, their prayers will go toward your temple. And so that's kind of the point of, you know, that, that Daniel has these windows that face, are facing toward Jerusalem, toward God's temple. So do Jewish people still do that today? Three times a day they, they, they pray? Well, I think the Orthodox Jews do, that they will face uh, to the east, or actually from wherever you are, face toward Jerusalem. Yeah. It's just you know, because the Muslims, mm -hmm. at least three times a day, will face Mecca. Okay. Yeah. And a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, Christian churches were built traditionally facing toward the east. Now, ours, when we do, well, we are facing toward the east, aren't we, uh, as we face toward our altar, mm -hmm. which is interesting. Uh, that, In fact, that's where our word orient uh, comes from. Orient, as you probably know, means east, uh, eastern. And so to orient yourself means to face toward uh, God's temple, and that's your orientation in life. It, I mean, we always talk about we use our compasses and stuff, and we get everything oriented. You're facing north, right? Or the North Star Polaris or something like that. And that's how you orient yourself and get your bearings. And in fact, the word bearings, I mean, Mr. Pilot can tell us, start at zero, that's due north, right? And go around the 360, right? And uh, uh, so we have north as our sort of bearing, but traditionally it was always, oh, the east, at least that's, the Western Christian's perspective is everything is facing toward Jerusalem. That's where God's uh, temple is. When they flew at Hawker Beach, uh, we picked up an airplane that had been traded in. We were bringing it back to the States. And we picked up in England. And it actually belonged to the Bin Laden family. So oh. I mean, this, is, this is a big family. <laughs> just that one bad guy out of the group. <laughs> um, and so on a lot of airplanes, you'll see a thing called air show. And air show shows you like where you're flying over now, what city, where you're going, direction, things like that. On their air show in the airplane, it always pointed, it showed them where Mecca was. So oh, if, if, if it was time to pray, they, they knew which way to face <laughs> while they're on the airplane. So for them, orientation is Mecca. Everything you know, points toward Mecca. For Jews and Christians, it's always been, well, Jerusalem is our orientation. And yet, as we'll talk about later in Daniel, it's uh, when Jesus comes along, it's not about the geophysical location of uh, Jerusalem that matters. It is we are facing toward Christ. And so in Christian churches, we put crosses uh, front and center and uh, over our altars to say our orientation is toward Christ, uh, necessarily the city of Jerusalem. 
God's not bound by directions. Yeah, exactly. And so, in some, in many Christian churches, that the tradition of oh, we should be facing east when we worship. Well, that's that doesn't. It's not about the east. It's about Christ is our orientation. Right. So, but that's why it's important to Daniel. Okay. Well. <coughs> We didn't, we didn't get to the dance, to the lion's den. Now we have the threat uh, hanging over Daniel of the lion's den. You see the lion's den. And, and the camp yeah. 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 The lion, the lion is waiting. <laughs> He's waiting. we're going to give him another week to get even hungrier. He's not going to eat a thing between now and uh, next time. And so uh, he is going to be awfully hungry by next week. <laughs> well, I have a feeling that in this case the lion's share was very little. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. He's not going to get a lion's share of Daniel, right? He can't help it. He does the same thing at home all the time. But see, the plot is very thick at this point because even King Darius, uh, even if he realizes what has happened, that he's been uh, deceived into uh, going against Daniel, what is he going to be able to do about it? He can't change the law. See, that's the that's the plot uh, thickness there. Is even the king can't save Daniel now? Who can save? And that that's the question. Is oh boy, who if the king can't save Daniel, who can save Daniel? Right? No, no human being can save Daniel at this point. All right. Okay. Let's uh, close with prayer. We thank you, God, our Heavenly Father, for always being with us and always blessing us, always uh, giving us uh, your word in our hearts and in our lives. We know that as we are oriented uh, toward you, toward our Savior Jesus Christ, toward your temple where you are present with us, that uh, we know that you go with us in all of our uh, daily life and that uh, as we orient ourselves toward your word that you will always bless us as we live out your commands. And so we pray that, uh, like Daniel, we would have that kind of boldness to know that you are with us and you will protect us in all things. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much for coming today. Next time we will, uh, we will get to Daniel and the lions. <laughs> Oh, do you? You gotta have that anticipation. Yeah. Yeah. What are you doing there? I'm building my area. You still work in the Yes, sir. I probably showed you what you were doing. You were doing your I think by spring, I'll be ready to leave the expensive houses here.
Yeah. 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 Yeah.